Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the fourth and final Ask the Engineers sessions. We're reflecting on the agreements reached at the COP26 summit in Glasgow and how the emissions targets that have been agreed can be achieved in practice. Um, it's a bit of background, the Paris Agreement signed in 2015 committed the world to holding global temperature rises to well below two degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels, whilst pursuing efforts to limit heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now those goals are legally binding and enshrined in the treaty, but to meet those goals, countries also agreed on non-binding national targets to cut, or in the case of developing countries, to curb the growth of greenhouse gas emissions in the near term by 2030 in most cases. The challenge for COP26 was to try and keep every nation on track to, as they said, keep 1.5 degrees alive. So did they succeed? According to the International Energy Agency, whose chief economist actually joined us for one of, one of the first of these panels, if all nations fulfill all their commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then we'd should be able to restrict global warming to about 1.8 degrees by the end of the century. Others are less optimistic, but the crucial part is how we achieve those emissions reductions and how it will impact on society. And that's what we're gonna be discussing tonight. Okay, so we're gonna be, we're gonna be working with Arup again as our technical partner for all these discussions. Um, Arup is synonymous with leading the engineering design as they aim to shape a better world. We'll also be taking your questions. Now to submit your questions, just type them into the live chat box on the right of your screen. You'll need to sign in if you haven't already done so. There's full instructions on how to do all of that in the event description. You can submit questions throughout this evening's discussion and we'll pose them to our panel um, at the end and we'll go through as many as we can, all the questions we've had throughout this series have been really interesting and made the panel and me think in very interesting ways. So I think it's always worth submitting your questions. Don't, don't worry about how simple or complicated you think they are, submit them and we'll get through them. All right, I'm joined by a very, very fantastic panel today. Professor Neele Shah is Professor of Process Systems Engineering at Imperial College London. And he's also Deputy Chair of the National Engineering Policy Center, Center National, let me say that again, National Engineering Policy Centers Net Zero Working Group. That's quite a mouthful, but I got it there in the end. Uh, Rachel Skinner has just finished her year as president of the Institution of Civil Engineers. She's an executive director at WSP, where she now leads on all aspects of UK corporate responsibility, including net zero and climate resilience. Dame Joanna da Silva is Global Director of Sustainable Development at Arup. She founded Arup International Development in 2007 to help improve human development, uh, human development outcomes in the Global South. Now, Guillermo Castro is a Project Innovations Manager at Octopus Energy Generation. He is Chair of the Energy Institute's Young Professionals Network in London and a leading voice in the Institute's Generation 2050 campaign. Okay, so welcome to all of our panel. Now, as with all the other events, I'm gonna ask them to start with two minutes of just answering the question that's the title of this panel discussion uh, as a way of introducing themselves and um, giving you a sense of the kinds of things that they think about. So first, Professor Neele Shah, um, the question for you is, post COP26, what have we achieved and where do we go from here? Great, thanks very much. So I, I'm, a, I'm a glass half full person. So I think COP26 identified and drilled down a bit into the important challenges that we have, both in the engineered world and the natural world. It identified quite a lot of the changes that need to be made and the targets we need to be set. I think one thing that was a good achievement was setting in motion a process by which countries enhance their ambitions for emissions reductions annually with the ratchet system. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll also see in place support mechanisms uh, for climate finance and particularly supporting developing countries with their energy and industrial transitions. Um, I would say there's a lot of detailed work still to be done. And you know, some estimates would say that the current firm commitments only put us on track for a 2.4 degree C rise. So we really need to make sure that, that that annual ratcheting of ambitions on the NDCs is strong and starts to get us 
into the 1.5 degree C ballpark. We did identify some really good short term actions around stopping deforestation, enhancing natural carbon sinks, rapidly reducing dependence on coal, uh, developing green grids and um, focusing very quickly on, on reducing methane emissions. And so I think overall, uh, quite positive. I think there are things to be done on, on damage that uh, were, were sort of left hanging. And I think there's still quite a lot to be done on um, the sort of very difficult sectors like uh, indus some industrial systems, aviation, agriculture. But overall, I think we, we've set a good direction. And I think the focus on particularly on coal and, and the ratcheting for me and the deforestation, they were the positive ones. Thank you, Nilo. Very, very positive indeed. Um, Rachel, you're up next. What, what do you think we've achieved in COP26 and uh, where do we go from here? Thanks, Alok. So I guess my start point for answering the exam question, if you like, is to pick out one thing that to me it feels that COP26 has achieved above all else. And that's the fact that it feels that the conference itself and the run up to it has ignited mainstream technical and engineering interest and similarly mainstream public interest and demand for some real visible, gritty, deliverable climate action on the ground because suddenly this feels that it is all about what society needs and wants to see. And I think that is really interesting. I think it's really exciting, especially for me. I've spent the past year in, in the run-up to COP26 as president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, as you just mentioned, and I really spent the entire year trying to inspire change that will swing the 200-plus-year-old the carbon-intensive juggernauts of today's infrastructure systems around so we can stop causing harm to our climate and start help to actually address the climate challenge. And that was across all the infrastructure sectors, so transport, water, waste, buildings, digital infrastructure, also, of course, energy infrastructure as well, right the way through from early planning, right the way through to everyday operation and their use of these systems by billions of people over many, many generations all over the world. So from my point of view, the easiest way, I guess, to summarise what we need to do is to think about two things. First, we have to attack the carbon, we have to find it, we have to work towards net zero through decarbonisation and so on, but also we have to get much more smart about how we adapt and add to our existing infrastructure so we're ready to defend communities against the impact of climate change that we know are out there and which lie ahead increasingly for all of us. And that's really fundamental change in terms of recognising the scale of change, the way we think about infrastructure, its function, its value, its impacts, but also what good decision making looks like now in this space given the climate crisis. So from my point of view, I really hope that COP26 going forward, and I should say I'm also a glass half full person, COP26 in, in my view will hopefully help us to kind of galvanize all this climate led effort that is now rumbling and, and get this much more right as we go forward. And I think for the engineering community, we already have a mandate. We don't need more policy setting. We don't need more technologies to start making more of a difference now. The very next thing we need is a whole heap of common sense. And of course, the policy, the technology and so on will help us over time. But we just need to change the bits that are in our control now and start to eat into these COP26 targets and hopefully beat them so we can genuinely try to keep 1.5 alive. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Dame Joanna De Silva, how about you? What do you think we achieved in COP26 and uh, where do we go from here? Uh, please call me Jo um, Alloc. Um, I um, came away from COP, I spent the best part of two weeks up there um, with more hope than I did when I went in uh, for three reasons. Um, the first was that for the first time in five years, um, cities and the built environment was on the agenda. Um, and cities in the built environment contributes 40% of global emissions. And that adds up to 14 gigatons per year, which is equivalent to the annual emissions of China. Um, and so really, you know, all of us who are involved in planning, designing, using the built environment have a role to play in driving down the emissions. Um, the second thing that I think was very vocal at COP was that this needs to be a much fairer and more equitable um, crisis response. Uh, in Africa, the countries in Africa have contributed overall to less than 3% of global emissions, if you add it up over time. And yet, these are some of the countries that have been worst affected by the impacts of climate change currently. And there was a very clear message in COP that we need to help 
countries in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, that are still developing to build the infrastructure they need, but to do so in a way that doesn't repeat the mistakes of the past, but leaps frog, leapfrogs to a, you know, to a net zero future. Um, and we must also remember that infrastructure is critical to improve the resilience of communities in those countries who are already experiencing that impacts of climate change. Um, but what we've seen this year, and it was talked about quite a lot, is the fact that the impacts of climate change are being felt everywhere. You know, the heat waves in Canada, the floods in, um, you know, uh, Europe or Russia. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges is that we need to really recognise that we've got to make all the infrastructure that exists on the planet at the moment, plus all the infrastructure that we create over the next decade or so, fit for a very different future when temperatures will be higher, um, that places will be either much wetter or much drier, and sea levels will have arisen significantly, because there's so much of that already hardwired into the system. Um, I think it's a huge challenge, but on the other hand, the engineering community are pretty good at stepping up to challenges once the world's really woken up to the problem. Um, I think what I heard at COP, I didn't hear any anyone at COP try and deny climate change. Um, that's very, very different to where we were five years ago. Well, that's good to know uh, that we're all on the same page at least. And, and Guillermo, how about you? Um, post COP26, what have we achieved and where do we go from here? Perfect, thank you a lot for the opportunity for the invitation, especially to be speaking, representing Young Voice post um, COP26. I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity. Um, I had, the experience, I experienced COP from two different perspectives. The first one will be my, my um, have, which is representing Octopus Energy there. We try to showcase the depth of the future in partnership with First Buzz, who is the local bus company. And the idea there, not only from Octopus, but from many companies that were there, is how this innovation, how these innovative companies are pushing the boundaries that we need to deliver solutions um, to solve climate change. And I think this, um, the diversity that we have there, how technology is playing, but not only innovating from the technology side, but also social innovation, is what we need to guarantee we can see after the event um, a positive perspective for the future and the huge challenge we have ahead. But on the other hand, from, from my participation in the Blue Zone with the negotiations and trying to understand more how the multilateral discussions happened, I think that this is my half-empty glass perspective. Um, climate emergency, it's, it's a problem that affects everyone. And when we go to the table to negotiate and we see countries pushing to change from phasing down to phasing out, go, um, and these minor details that maybe can influence the discussions of the future and how we're going to um, put investments from the, the green side, um, I think this is it's where I, I stick with Vanessa and saying we had 25, now 26 COPs already, and there are a lot of commitments. It's time now to go to action. And for me, the future, what, what I see is how we can collaborate. These are companies, government, and individuals. How can we work from inside our companies, from inside the organizations we are, to hack the system and deliver uh, in a more quick speed and more pay, a, a faster pace the solutions that we need? And second is how we bring more and more young to the table, to the discussions, because I believe this intergenerational gap is a essential to connect who caused the problem with who will suffer the consequences in the future, but also is the most creative to bring the solutions we need. All right. So a good dose of reality from everyone there. But I think you're all quite positive and energized by what's what's been going on. Um, if you're joining us just now, um, we're talking about what's been achieved at COP26 in Glasgow and what needs to happen next. Um, so everyone here has uh, listened and been either at the conference itself and has solutions for the future. I think that there's a lot of energy to sort of try and get things done now. Um, there are a lot of big questions and big challenges, and we're going to look at them in a bit more detail. You can ask questions as well if you're watching, so just put them in the chat box and there are instructions in the event description. Now, if we want to cut emissions, we clearly need to take a quite holistic approach and adopt solutions that can work across the whole of society. So, Neelay, 
you told us how important it is to integrate engineering systems. What what are the critical decisions we should be taking first? Um, what you might call low regret actions to help us get to net zero? Yeah, so low regret actions are things we, we know we need to do. We know that they're the things that make sense to do early on and they're the things that can have big impacts. So some good examples are stopping and reversing deforestation and habitat, habitat destruction. We know that you know, the natural environment, if treated correctly, can become a large carbon sink and can help stabilize the climate and provides a lot of secondary benefits as well. Second of all, we need to focus much more on energy and resource efficiency. That means more efficient industries, energy systems, buildings, transport. The, 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 the easier uh, or the, the, the more we reduce you know, the, the use of resources, the easier it is to decarbonize the supply of those resources. We need to accelerate the transition out of coal, particularly in power generation. Um, and in doing that, we need to think about um, green and smart grids. We know we need green grids. We know we need smart grids. We may as well start getting that infrastructure in place because it, it will be vital to supporting this transition out of coal. We need to scale up proven technologies, for example, increasing the use of electricity and increasing the generation of low carbon electricity. Uh, and then we need to demonstrate and develop some of the emerging technologies that are going to be part of the mix so that we're not relying on them too late. So that could be even things like, you know, capturing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. We need to at least start that, that uh, development and demonstration. You mentioned coal there. Um, I might as well get your thoughts on this. What, what did you make of that last minute change to uh, start? What, what was it to, instead of instead of phase out phase down coal reduction. We know why countries like India want that to happen because they have lots of coal reserves. But what, as, as, a, as an expert in this area of trying to get to zero emissions, what do you make of that? I think it, I, I fully understand why it happened because you know, to, to run a complex electricity system where you do need to have firm generation that works regardless of the weather, you do need some supplies that um, are there to support your industrial base. If you couple that with the fact that there's going to be a lot of increased demand in the developing world, they want to see what mix of electricity generation system will, will, will meet that need. And so I think there's a nervousness of, of, of rushing too click, quickly with this coal transition. And I think one of the roles of engineering is to demonstrate how quickly can you go and what are the co-benefits of transitioning out of coal and moving into other forms of power generation. So I think I, I think it, it shouldn't necessarily be seen as a terrible thing that there was a slight change of phrasing. It's about a lack of confidence in how quickly that can happen while maintaining economic development and a reliable power supply and access to energy, which, of course, is one of the SDGs. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, um, you, you've got a quite a shocking statistic that uh, around 70 percent of the world's carbon dioxide emissions can be traced back to infrastructure and transport systems. That's massive, that's huge. Um, what can engineers do to start taking chunks out of that? Yeah, you're absolutely right, it is massive. Um, just, just to be clear, because there are lots of numbers that fly around on, on these sorts of things, um, that 70% figure is a sort of an all-in figure when you track everything to do with, whether it's the, the planning, the design, the build of infrastructure, right the way through to the way we use those systems and then the way that you know essentially they operate in our everyday society so it's absolutely anything and everything that can be tracked back to infrastructure but it is absolutely huge and, and shocking as you say um, and, and for me I think more than anything else in terms of what we can do to, to reduce that and this really did stand out for me in, in my time at COP26 just a few weeks ago um, addressing this climate challenge addressing specifically the, the the carbon aspects but also other aspects of it as well it is much more around culture and behavior change for the industrial industrialized world in, in particular because really it's around asking ourselves the right questions kind of daring to ask the right questions sometimes because they have really tricky answers exactly as we were just hearing um, but also finding kind of ever improving answers bearing in mind that we are going to be working in a context where we don't know everything and and you know that the leading edge of what good looks like will keep on shifting because we are having to to sort of feel our way into this at speed so we're going to have to get much more comfortable with uncertainty which actually from an engineering point of view is easy to say and quite difficult to do so we're going to have to figure out how we kind of strike the right balance um, in terms of how challenging it will be I mean on the one hand 
hugely challenging because we're talking about something that's going to affect every investment being made every investment being considered across the whole spectrum of everything that we do um, as engineers of all different varieties. And it starts right at the earliest concept stage and runs right the way through to, you know, long established operational systems, as, as Joe was mentioning um, a few minutes ago. So essentially, we have to put this carbon lens, this climate lens across everything we do and just challenge ourselves to do much, much better. Um, and I guess we'll know when we've got there because we'll get to a point where it feels normal and natural to do that as opposed to special or you know in some ways out of the ordinary um i think though on a really much more positive note i think there is a lot of hope here i think there is a massive opportunity for fast change and i mentioned common sense um a little bit earlier on um for me we've never taken mainstream action on carbon or climate before from the point of view of engineering and infrastructure we simply haven't asked ourselves those questions except in very rare niche corners of the industry so actually some of these changes will actually be fairly straightforward and sometimes they won't actually carry extra costs sometimes they might even be cheaper so perhaps the trick is just to see how far and fast we can actually go with some of those to get the ball rolling and then over time we can we can introduce you know more and more of these challenging aspects as we go along so um i, I guess i'm not saying we should consider climate and carbon above all else in the world of engineering we simply have to get carbon and climate to the table so that we are making these decisions in light of those impacts as well as everything else that of course we need to think about in terms of everything from public safety and and cost to indeed the wider aspects of sustainability so that the full spectrum of economic environmental and social outcomes that we're after thanks rachel um joe now you've worked with um many of the world's most innovative designers and architects and um, but a challenging uh, and sort of provocative question for you. Do you think that we should just be building less in the future? We certainly should be building less. Uh, one of the things that we launched at uh, COP was a piece of work we've been developing with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is the a toolkit for buildings. Um, and, you know, that's really saying, you know, we, we, we've got to stop this absurd cycle which is really, we, you know, we build buildings, we use them for maybe 20, 30 years, and then we demolish them. We send all the materials to landfill and we start again. Um, and, you know, this is completely unsustainable. Uh, one of the things the engineering community has really woken up to over the last uh, few years is the amount of carbon associated with the embodied energy in buildings. Um, so, it's, it's sort of 11, 12 percent, and it can be as much as 50 percent, depending on the building type. And so the, you know, we actually have to rethink buildings as, and think, start thinking about them in a totally different way as being repositories of materials um, that can then be disassembled and recycled or reused or repurposed. Um, so I see that um, there's going to be a lot of change. You know, when I started my career, it was all about, you know, high design, um, you know, designing really sensational buildings. I think we're moving into an era when it's going to be much more about retrofitting buildings, both for energy transition, because buildings that operate currently on oil and gas are going to have to operate on different sources of fuel in the future, but also for energy efficiency because we've got to drive down the amount of energy that buildings use in order to match the pace of electrification of the grid. Um, and that's, you know, that's a big change. I think we're going to see new building technologies, which from a structural engineering point of view is incredibly exciting. Um, I think we're going to see more use of renewable materials like bamboo um, and you know, emergence of codes of practice for some of these materials, which is one of the, the biggest barriers to their adoption um, at the moment. And so I think all of that actually, I think is incredibly exciting because it's opening up all kinds of scope for innovation in terms of design, but also in terms of the business models and supply chains that um, underpin the built environment. Um, and so sometimes I think I wish I was 30 years younger and beginning my career because, you know, what a fun time to actually be be entering the profession um, and able to address some of these really big issues. Well, talking of, um, you know, young people um, actually trying to have solve these problems, Gia, Guillermo, I mean, you know, you've heard everything that's just been said about those challenges involved. Are, I mean, are you excited or daunted by this as a generation of young engineers who actually have to solve all this stuff? 
<laughs> um, I'm always excited, I think. Um, and this is one of the challenges we have, is how we can get the experience of people that is already leading the sector at the moment with the new blood, the new ideas that we as a young generation bring to the table in the way to solve the, the problem. I think that the challenge is hard and we need to collaborate. We need to, to bring different forces, especially outside also the, our own sectors. I see this a lot in the energy sector. If you, we had a, a quite of a dynamic during the COP event where we introduced our video that was recorded before the event, interviewing young professionals from North Sea, Scotland to, to Glasgow. And the discussion was always, who is your main mentor? And normally it's everyone has a mentor that is inside your own sector. And you cannot think outside the box, which is exactly what climate emergency requires uh, requests from us, is thinking different alternatives to solve the problem that we have been here for so long. And uh, Nile was talking about the speed that I'm phasing down and uh, slightly changing from an engineering perspective. We do not, we cannot leapfrog tomorrow outside coal um, in our energy system, but I'm sure that we can speed the pace we are doing this transition, um, comparing the availability we have in other countries. Brazil, from where I'm from, it's a good example. We are a rich country in natural resource for wind, solar, um, and hydro. We have one of the largest rate of uh, renewable generation already in our energy mix, but we are investing thermal um, generation now to solve a short-term problem compared to what we should be doing, like the UK uh, saying that uh, we are in a crisis with the gas price, but we are looking for the future and we want to phase out gas from more energy mix. So I think it, there is a lot of uh, political will and this part from the pressure that we can create as a young generation in who we vote, who we establish and who we um, select to lead us or even ourselves, putting ourselves forward to be the solution. Very, very encouraging. Um, now COP26 saw some of the world's smallest nations, uh, many of which are right off the front of climate change, pleading with developed nations to honour their pledges and take action to reduce emissions. Um, Nile, can I ask you, what can the engineering community do to help ensure that there's a just transition to global net zero, that, um, that everyone gets a say and it's not just an excuse for developed nations to carry on with business as usual and just force their ideas onto everyone else? So I think engineering has, has an interesting role in the sense that we can paint a positive picture of the future. Because I think if, if, we, if, 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 we, if we have a message of doom and gloom, pe people shut down very quickly and they, they don't want to accept that there's going to be a big transformation. So I think the first thing we really need to do as a community is paint a positive picture of what a 1.5 degree C world looks like. And the fact that it's achievable technically it's achievable economically and it brings a lot of positive co-benefits. And so we need to demonstrate that and to give people confidence to, to be more ambitious with their NDCs so that we will reach at least 1.5 and you know, preferably even, even within that safe limit. Uh, and that means demonstrating the, the technical feasibility of strong climate ambition, quantifying these co-benefits, but equally really being explicit about the risks of inaction and delay. Uh, and from that, you know, demonstrating that we do need a fair solution, explore ways of ensuring that these system transitions work for everyone. And that means in the developed world, thinking about, you know, social and distributional effects in terms of job transitions and economic transitions. And then looking in other parts of the world in terms of supporting adaptation and supporting the, the energy transition, particularly in, in an area which we call climate compatible growth. How can we use this big change we're going to go through over the next 30 years to demonstrate new economic growth models that are not so demanding of resources and which are sustainable? And so I think that that's what we need to do as engineers. OK, thank you. And Joe, how do we put communities in vulnerable groups um, such as children, elderly people at the centre of infrastructure and city design um, in the future? I think we really have to um, take this issue of just transition um, very seriously and not hide behind that as a phrase, but really to think hard about social justice. Um, you know, there is, you know, equity 
nature and climate was a triumvirate in many, many conversations at COP, recognising we can't just solve climate in isolation. We've got to address the inequity that exists. You know, climate is a, an agenda that is inequitable in terms of, you know, the younger population and the older population. It's the older population and, you know, our forebears who have caused the problem. Um, and it's younger engineers, younger people generally, who are going to be living through the worst of climate change. But it's also unjust in terms of the poorer nations that are still developing, who haven't contributed much to climate change, are bearing the brunt of climate change. Um, I first started working on climate in 2007 in Southeast Asia, and there the impacts of climate change were already visible. They were already being felt. And so, you know, it's, it's a decade, more than a decade of frustration that's built up. So the first thing I think we need to do is to listen and to take it really seriously. We're not paying lip service when we're talking about the urgency of climate change. People's lives and their livelihoods are being affected at the moment. Um, I think the second thing is to then take responsibility and really think hard about what we can do. Um, and we can share our knowledge much more generously. There are businesses and organizations that exist in the so-called global north who see some of these countries affected by climate change as a new market, um, rather than actually seeing the need to share knowledge, to build capacity, to build the local capacity that's needed to actually address, um, address the re very real challenges they face. One of the most shocking things for me is the fact that the um, G20 countries haven't yet stomached up the 100 billion that was promised for adaptation and resilience. You know, in contrast, you know, Mark Carney is saying that the private sector will stump up a trillion. Um, but even if the money's there, what we need to do as an engineering community is help make sure that that money is well spent, that it's spent on projects in these countries that are actually really going to help, you know, and that they're, that they're well-conceived, well-planned projects. Um, when you look at the number of engineers per capita in Africa compared to, say, Europe or North America, it's a very, very tiny amount. You know, we need, you know, we need millions of new engineers. And I think there's a big effort needed by this community to actually really think proactively, how are we going to create the number of engineers that are going to be needed to help vulnerable communities around the world build the infrastructure that they need to develop and build that infrastructure in a way that it's going to contribute to their resilience in future. Thank, thank you, Joan. That, that's it's a good setup for, for a question I've got for Guillermo, which is how do we make any of this realignment work, work economically so that the less developed nations do reap benefits um, and have incentives to move towards net zero. Because I mean, obviously, as Nile said earlier, there are these many countries have to develop. They want electricity for their citizens. They want to have jobs and all these things. And the fastest way to do that at the moment is fossil fuels, because that's just the way the, the, the industries have worked so far. So there's got to be incentives for them, right, to to to, to do it in a different way. Yes. Um I, I have so much to echo what Joel just um, explained, it, I think, in terms of the, the responsibility with countries in the Global South, coming from Brazil again, with this perspective. Um, I think a carbon market that is uh, interrelated, interlinked with all the countries, all global now, North and South, it's a really good tool that you have to transfer benefits when the countries in the Global South are creating projects and guarantee that they're going to be remunerated in a sort of way for protecting the forest. And what we need to think when a problem is global is that any emissions that we, deforestation that is happening in Brazil and any other country in the global south, because they need to develop, is impacting also countries on the global north. So from the perspective of generation, we see the UK leading um, the offshore development, but of course countries in the global south has a good potential to use the offshore seas to develop their renewable generation and maybe be a substitute of in the energy mix. How can we make these um, agreements? How can we guarantee that we have uh, technology transfer agreements 
between the global north countries with the global south rather than just seeing a new opportunity to exploit the market after you have developed here and then you would just want to sell. If we don't see solutions from a collaboration perspective rather than the continuous cheaper market to just sell the technology you develop here and then you export, we're going to have a huge challenge. We're going to replicate the same problems we had in the past. So to guarantee this benefit, uh, we need to create really clear, transparent mechanism of transferring of uh, finance. So green finance, we have a lot of money in developed countries. How can we make this accessible to developing, um, to developing nations that want to invest and guarantee that they join this transition and they increase their contribution to the market? But also, we cannot keep using developing countries as carbon sinks for the development that you have in the global north. For a long time, we were the places where products, cars, everything would be manufactured and then come back here. This cannot exist anymore. So I'm, I'm a big defensor of everything that is decentralized from the logistics perspective, from how you increase efficiency, especially in the energy sector. But we need to come back. I know that the globalized world opened the boundaries for many countries that you could manufacture everything that went where it was cheaper. But now we need to add on the equation the impact that this will happen in the local environment and how the local communities will be left behind if anything happens there on the commodity um, volatility that we see. This is the reality in the mining sector. This is the reality in car manufacturing sectors. You have cities that become ghost cities after companies left them without transferring the benefits of the development. So we need to do this different. And I believe this is um, carbon market and how you mobilize finance for the global south is one or um, two tools that you can guarantee this economic benefit to share it with the global south. I, I'm, I'm expecting that if there are people as passionate in believing um, what you're saying as, as you are passionate, I think that that probably will happen. It, see, it seems like uh, it's not going to be left to the sidelines anyway. Sticking with you, Guillermo, just for one more question. And that there was a big um, to include the voices of young people at COP26. Um, we saw a lot of street marches. Greta Thunberg was in uh, there and criticizing politicians for um, you know too much talking, blah, 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 I think you said. But there are also many young people inside the event engaging with negotiators. Um, including you. Uh, so you had a leading role with a, a global group of over 1,000 young energy experts in, generation, in the Generation 2050 initiative. Um, are you still optimistic that there's a lot of will for intergenerational action to um, help address climate, um, climate emergency? Indeed, not only optimistic, but believing that this is the way forward, I think. To, to guarantee. Um, what I, from my period there in Glasgow and what I listen a lot is about how we can first solve the problem in the short term. And I think this is how can we make the transition from sectors like the oil and gas sector in North Sea, Scotland, to guarantee that the current workforce will have a place to work in the future. We cannot think from a leapfrog perspective that uh, tomorrow we change our whole energy mix and the this will guarantee that the jobs continue where they are. There is a huge um, contribution from the government to guarantee that this transition in the short term with the current generation that is working in sectors that won't exist or won't have the same contribution in the near future, have a smooth transition. But also how we do this in the future, how we go to the universities, how we bring climate change awareness to the discussions and to the education um, institutions that we have to the education system, not only in the UK, but uh, worldwide. I think that this is the way we're going to connect both generations. So it's explaining to the current one for those that are still not believing climate change or thinking that it's something that it will happen in 20, 30 years, that the emergency is now and it's a problem created and we need the help to deliver, but also bringing the new generation up to speed and saying we are the solution how we can collaborate with who is leading now to deliver this solution together. So I think this is the bridge. It's how we create awareness about the emergency and what are the skills we need to make this transition possible from both the current generation and the future one. 
Thank you, Guillaume. Yeah, I, 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 I'm getting very inspired by your energy here. I think you should definitely, uh, whatever you need, you can have it uh, to make this thing happen. Uh, Rachel, um, you um, you just finished um, as your as, as a year as a president of the Institution of Civil Engineers. Um, in 200 years, though, you're the first woman and the youngest person to be the the um, the, the president. Do you think? I mean, there's probably a bigger question about whether institutions and uh, big learning societies and things are, uh, need to be more inclusive and all of that. But is the engineering profession now, do you think it's in a different place and is much more inclusive in its approach to tackling climate change and wants to be that way? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm just, just, just on a point of tiny detail. Um, I'm the second woman, but yes, definitely oh, the youngest the president woman. so far. But there we go. It's all good. <laughs> <Okay>. Anyway, <laughs> that's still not quite good enough for two and three years, is it? But there well, we go. Gonna, it's still in two <laughs> centuries. That's not enough. Really, well, you actually. know, there we are. Um, but no, I think, I think just picking up on on that last question uh, as a kind of a run into my answer on, on this one. Um, one of the roles that I played actually at COP26 was to help a group of young people representing the, the, the UN, the World Bank, the World Federation of Engineering Organisations, um, young climate experts to, to launch their manifesto essentially for climate action within the COP26 Blue Zone and, and to work just as we've just been hearing here in, in, with the, um, the negotiation teams and, and trying to just bring together some of this thinking. What I found was fascinating there from the perspective, I guess I'm in the middle of my career, but from the perspective of those who are, you know, you know, a little a little younger than I am, is that four of their 12 asks in terms of that manifesto were very simple. It was just involve us <laughs> in these conversations. Let us in so that we can actually sort of play our part and, and you know, recognise that the stake, both professional and personal, that we have in this outcome. And, and to me, it just makes complete sense because, uh, you know, clearly we need to do much better on that front. But coming more fully, I guess, to your question around whether or not we're now in a place from an engineering point of view where we are able and keen even <laughs> to take a more inclusive approach. I think from my point of view, the answer is increasingly yes, but we are starting from, a, I guess, a, a very small, low base here and, and we have a long way to go. So from my own personal point of view, of course, it has to be a, a hugely noisy, resounding yes. And if I'm honest, it does feel that the engineering profession is probably more ready than ever to take advantage of, you know, being more inclusive, thinking in a more diverse way, embracing adjacent expertise in as needed. But I would say, sadly, we are not there yet. And, and actually, as a counterpoint to, to one of Joe's comments earlier on, I have had over the last year in my ICE role, real letters and real messages from a small number of people who have basically told me that, I am wrong, that <laughs> climate change is not real, and that engineering essentially has no role to play. It is none of our business. We are not climate scientists. That is interesting <laughs> in the sense that it is such a sort of a, an opposed view. But I'm pleased to say that th those sort of messages were few and far between. And actually, the resounding majority were saying the exact opposite, you know, much more of a sort of a, you know, uh, almost a feeling of relief that at last we are actually going to get on with this. So I think from the point of view of whether you think about it from the point of view of age or, or gender or other key characteristics of a, a truly diverse and inclusive engineering community and indeed adjacent communities, um, while there is some evidence that there are people out there who are not on board with the issue and not on board with, with if you like, sort of widening our outlook and lifting our eyes and so on, um, I think there are many more who are keen. And I think, frankly, our best bet is just to get on with all those thousands of people, possibly millions of people all over the world, uh, you know, a broad range of professionals who really do get it and they are keen they're ready to embrace this this more creative mindset um, because for me that is exactly how we're going to get to the right kind of change the kind of change that safeguards our our collective more sustainable future and to me that is precisely what engineering has to be all about from now wow i mean engineers writing into you to say that climate change is not anything to do with engineers i mean I don't know. I don't know what to do with that information. It just seems it boggles me, it boggles my mind to think that could be possible. I'm um, afraid it's true. <laughs> all right, thank you, thank you. Okay, well, we're going to come to the audience questions now. There's loads already. Um, we're going to open up the panel now. But remember, you can still um, submit your questions from the audience in the live chat box on the right of the screen. You'll need to sign in. Um, so, and full instructions on how to do this are in the event description. So, do ask, and we'll answer as many as we can. All right, so uh, remember to the panel, if you specifically want to answer the question, then do put your hand up. Otherwise, I might just farm it to one of you and see, see who, if you're aware it can go. 
All right, first question. Can you imagine a time when the engineering design sector, uh, uh, organizations like WSP and Arab, will refuse to bid for work or on carbon increasing projects, uh, such as airport expansion? That's a great question. All right, there's only one person who can answer this one, Joe. <laughs> um, Rachel, I'm sure, can answer too. Um, yeah. The answer is we already are. Um, you know, we announced at COP that we were not uh, going to be doing any work on hydrocarbon projects going forwards. Um, so, you know, that's a that's a categorical that we are, you know, we're not supporting uh, uh, those those type of projects. We will continue to work with oil and gas companies in the aspects of their work, which are actually transitioning to um, a new energy mix in the future. Um, but we already have put in place about uh, sort of two years ago now um, changes to our bid procedures to actually, you know, put carbon in there alongside, you know, commercial success as a factor in deciding whether we do a project. And I think Rachel mentioned this earlier is, you know, we just really need to get to a point where carbon is just part of every decision we make. And, you know, you wouldn't think about um, doing a building without understanding the budget, um, you, know, and, you know, and we've actually got to move quite quickly to a position where we don't design buildings without understanding how much carbon they're creating and how much carbon they're creating over their whole life cycle, because it's not just the the carbon associated with running the energy systems in the building and the lighting. It's not just the carbon associated with the construction. It's the carbon associated with replacing the facades, replacing the building services, you know, replacing the furniture and fit out when the buildings relet. And so one of the things that um, I was doing a lot of in COP was really pushing for the introduction of whole life carbon um, cycle costing as, as mandatory you know, across the business as, you know, it's something that the government should be asking for um, through regulatory requirements. It's something that um, Arup has decided we are introducing on all our buildings, um, all our buildings projects. And one of the reasons for that is simply so we can understand better how much carbon is in those buildings. Um, because with that data, we can have much better insights into what are the real worthwhile things to do to reduce carbon. I mean, the reality at the moment is no one's really measuring carbon through the whole life cycle. We're all doing it on some projects, but once we move to a position where we're doing it on all projects, carbon just becomes a new currency that will, will radically change the decisions we make. Yeah, I mean, having a carbon price, uh, carbon markets, these things would also encourage that wouldn't it um rachel what about you um, do, do you think that um engineering design companies will start to back away from carbon increasing projects so i think first of all i, I agree with a lot of what joe has just said there I, I think though it's it's not just a question for engineering design companies i think this is a question for the whole of the infrastructure delivery and change ecosystem so what we need really to see is that the investors, the, the clients, the consultants, the contractors, all of the supply chain, there's a very, very long tail attached to all of this. If everybody starts to move into a space where we are thinking similarly around those impacts and, and you know, the, the true impact of what it is we think we're going to do, I think that will start to, to see change in, in hopefully a, a faster way, because as we've all been saying, this is all about pace as well as direction of change. Um, one of the things that that we've done that might be of interest from a, from a WSP point of view, we've made a commitment from a UK point of view to halve the carbon associated with our designs and advice in this decade, essentially. So trying uh, to figure out really exactly the piece that Joe was just talking about there, you know, where is the carbon? What, how do we quantify that? How do we quantify that the benefit or the impact that each of these projects actually brings and how do we simply bring that down over time? And, and I think, again, if if everybody could figure out how to do that, then hopefully it, it's more of a, a mindset shift than necessarily needing to have sort of, you know, large sticks to beat people with as the only lever in our in our toolbox, if that makes sense. Thank you, Rachel. Um, OK, next question. Um, what signals can we look out for to indicate that real progress will be happening when countries return to the table next year at COP27. Um, 
Neil, maybe I can point this one to you. What, what I mean, for, for the rest of us who, this, it's so complicated keeping track of all this stuff. What, what are the big ticket things we can be looking out for if we want to keep on track? I think that's where we would look for, for some concrete plans around. Uh, a really good example would be coal retirement plans. So one of the big things that the COP president was really interested in was concrete plans for three things. Number one, you know, phasing out of existing coal generation uh, plants. Number two, you know, reducing the pipeline. And, and number three, then thinking down the line, um, completely uh, getting out of of any kind of even uh, projects that are not even sort of, you know, they're on the planning board. So there's the, the ones that are in construction, the ones that are operating and the ones that are in, in, in just on the planning board is really looking at a, a strong acceleration and actually firm commitment from countries to demonstrate that that is actually happening. I think that's one of the things we're looking for over the next 12 months. I think we want to look at some things around deforestation to see that there's some practical action happening there. And that might be in the form of economic transfers that Guillermo uh, mentioned uh, as an example. And then I think, you know, in, 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 in more practical terms, uh, there's an organization called the NDC Partnership. It's working with a lot of countries around the world and it's looking at two things. Number one, how to turn the existing ones in, in, into practical roadmaps. But number two, more importantly, how to make them more ambitious. So we'd really like to see in a year's time, countries coming back with revised NDCs, which are, which are clearly more ambitious, but second of all, with, with some practical roadmaps, with examples being the coal retirement of, of how they will actually achieve them. So that's the kind of thing we should be able to see in a year's time. That's very helpful. Thank you. Now, we've got nine minutes left before the session ends, so I'm going to try and battle through as many questions as possible. So if I can politely ask, I'm, I'm going to point these questions at you in the panel and then give me some clipped answers uh, to, to these questions uh, so we can get through as many as possible. Um, how is this all going to be financed? Pri private capital will want to return. Governments will need to raise taxes, and that will be difficult and unpopular. Um, that's a that, that's, that's a perennial, isn't it? For any any time the government seems to want to spend money or, or people want to move in different directions, you know, certain people will say, oh, this is all going to cost too much. Um, I mean, I have my own thoughts on this, but uh, Rachel, you're nodding. Give, give us your thought. Uh, a very, very, very fast answer on this one on. is that, that the, the cost of taking action now will be a whole lot less than the cost of waiting and introducing more risk and more urgency and having less time to deal with exactly these same problems later on. So, so frankly, it's a false thing to be comparing spending versus simply not spending, because actually all we're doing is setting ourselves up for a bigger problem as we, as we go forward. I'm glad you pointed that out. Thank you, Rachel. That's exactly right. Um, Neela, did you want to add a quick comment? Only to say, I always say this at every single climate change event I'm at, for 150 years we've been cheating ourselves paying the wrong price for good services and energy. And all we'll be doing during the transition is finally paying the true price rather than sharing it with our children, grandchildren, or people in other countries. So what we're doing in the transition is we're going to go to a point where we'll start paying the true cost. And the way we need to do that is probably through some form of global carbon pricing and to do that as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, Guillermo, did you want to say something quickly? Yes. Um just a final comment is that we need to think that a climate change impact goes beyond the environment. So we are talking about health issues, education issues, um, um, gender inequality, because women suffer more in global South countries, the impact that we have of climate change. So we need to think the total cost rather than just the environmental impact that we would have. And this is a huge, huge uh, debt that we need to equalize from Global South to Global North countries. So we need to think beyond just climate impact uh, on the environmental side, but see from a holistic point of view. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, okay, really quick um, questions now. Uh, the UK needs a massive increase in renewable electricity and distribution to power electric cars and vans, um, heat pumps, etc. potentially as much as 20 more than 20 Hinkley Point power stations. I'm not, that, I'm not fact check that, but that's what the questioner asks. Is this even vaguely realistic? Uh, Nina, yes or no? <laughs> um, I, I don't think we need to go that far because I think that's where the smart green grids come in. Yeah. And so if, if, if you did it in a very uh, sort of naive way and said for the one hour peak demand, we need everything to be generating, then that could well be the case. But actually 
we can be very sophisticated in different ways of storing energy and different ways of actually shaving off peak demands and, and spreading them throughout the day and throughout the year. So I think intelligent energy systems as well as low carbon is, is what we need. Okay. Um, what can what is the most important thing? This, this, this sort of um, speaks to a couple of the questions, actually. What is the most important thing that people can do at home to reduce emissions? Um, this question asks, uh, should we all install heat pumps? For five pounds, go and buy some draft excluder and put that around your doors and windows. And it that's the biggest, re biggest return on investment you, you can get. Because actually you know leakiness is, is probably the biggest problem you know to, to be dealt loft, with. Loft, loft insulation as well, probably as well. Stick some loft insulation up. You know what? You know, <laughs> for, for, for a long time, I reported on this stuff and I kept asking myself, you know, what are the exciting projects to go and see around the world? And every single engineer said to me, just put some loft insulation in, you know? that was It was, it was all that sort of boring stuff, but it's, it works, right? So what about heat pumps? I mean, everyone's talking about heat pumps. Is that a good idea, uh, Jo? Um, I'm a big um, advocate for fabric first. Um, there's no point spending money on heat pumps unless you've sorted out the, the building fabric, as much insulation as possible, as little leakage um, as possible. Um, you know, the other two things that um, you know everyone really needs to think about is, is travel less, and if you do travel, Make it active travel. That's good for you too, the bicycling or the, or the walking, you know. Um, and, and the third thing is just buy less stuff. Um, and, you know, we've all got lots of stuff in our homes and, uh, you know, we, we just don't need to buy as much stuff. stuff. There's a huge amount um, of energy, not just locked up in, in the heating and the lighting in our homes, but also the, the stuff that we bring in the front door. Um, and uh, circular principles can apply at home too. A stark warning just before Christmas as well. So, <laughs> can you believe it? No, you're absolutely right. Of course, you're absolutely right. Um, we've probably got time for a couple more questions. Um, how much are our complex supply chains and just-in-time deliveries contributing to the problems of emissions and waste? Um, complex supply chains and just-in-time deliveries, of course, being squeezed hugely right now and showing how how um, you know how uh, fragile they are. Um, who would like to take that one? I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the need to shift to a circular um, economy, and we need and also about the, the question earlier about being inclusive. Um, we need to actually think in terms of whole systems and whole value chains. Um, and and move beyond where we are at the moment, which is a very fragmented um, industry, particularly when it comes to infrastructure in the built environment, with a lot of disconnects in the value chain um, due to procurement processes. Um, and really what we need to do is to be right from the get-go working from suppliers right the way through to investors and developers um, and, and, and thinking about it as a, as a total system and, and driving down emissions that way. Um, rather like we've got to, you know, re think differently about value, we've also got to think very differently about procurement um, and think about all the actors um, involved. All right, I'm going to, one more question to Guillermo. Um, uh, do you think the right people were in the room at COP? Um, who else do we need to be including in the discussions, do you think? Um, and then the question also asks, should we be removing lobbyists and other groups or do they actually help? Um, I, I think that, that that's a hard question to think. Um, from the first point, I think that we should include more. We, we should. Re, we, we said a lot that the blue zone was um, democratic, but when we have the green split from the blue, I think that we should bring more people to the discussion tables. Um, I, I know that when we transmit it live through the internet, you are allowing people to watch, but it's a passive action. We need to bring these people to the discussions and create um, focus group areas where they can contribute actively to the discussion rather than just watching what is being decided between uh, behind the walls. Um, this is one point on the action. And second, lobbying, it's a, it's a challenging answer because you have people that is lobbying for the good stuff as well, that are trying to push forward renewable energy, um, energy efficiency, and any other solutions. So I believe needs to be transparent. So we are clear who is lobbying after uh, for every type of sort of things. And 
I think transparency is uh, it's, is the reason is the solution here. So we we are clear what is defending which type of um, status quo to keep as it is or to push forward solutions that will be better for the the public good, the common general aspect. Um, we're almost up time, but I'm going to have a really quick one, very final, quick, quick, quick question. Um, how can we keep the COP discussion going and keep people engaged and interested in how the commitments will will be met? Um, Rachel, maybe you can tackle this one. Uh, really briefly, uh, simply all of us have to keep talking about it. We have to keep changing the game. We have to keep you know, bringing up the agenda and we have to take responsibility for making sure that if it's not being heard, that, that we are doing everything we can, all of us and everybody listening as well right now to, to make that happen. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we're right at the end of time now. That's all we have time for today, unfortunately. And it just remains for me to thank our excellent panel for answering all your questions um, in such rapid fire style at the end as well. Nile, Joe, Guillermo and Rachel. Uh, this is our last event of the Ask the Engineers COP26 series, and it's been a great series of discussions on how engineering solutions and systems can help us achieve net zero emissions. I hope you've enjoyed them as much as we have in putting them together for you. There's a link in the chat to a brief follow-up survey of this event, so um, that link will also be shared in an email, so thank you in advance for your feedback. Uh, thank you also to the Academy and to Arab as technical partners on this series. Now, all our panel discussions are recorded and available on the Academy website. So if you'd like to watch any of them again or share them with others, you can just go there. And you can keep in touch with the National Engineering Policy Center's Engineering Zero program on the Academy website by following RAE Eng uh, News on Twitter or using the hashtag, hashtag Engineering Zero. So you can go to RANG um, Twitter, uh, News on Twitter or use the hashtag Engineering Zero. Until um, we see meet again one day, uh, goodbye and do keep talking about climate change, as Rachel said, that's how the conversation keeps going. Take care and goodbye.